we are off and underway. Here comes the chase behind. It's a steep climb. This is a good move now. Can he try and hang on? Lines up for the sprint. Can he steal this one? Is he going to take the stage? Yes, he is. Hello, welcome. Good to have your company for highlights of stage four of this year's AJ Bell Tour of Britain. And it is the Queen stage today, and what a stunning setting for it. Starting in Aberaeron, hugging the Cardigan Bay coast, and then heading inland across Snowdonia before finishing right up there on the Great Orm in Llandidno on the North Wales coast. It's going to be absolutely stunning. The pictures will be incredible on what is a beautiful day and possibly the last sunny day of this year's Tour of Britain. Sure to be quite a few tired legs, though, after yesterday's team time trial in Carmarthenshire. After 180 kilometres and 3,500 metres of climbing the day before, completely different for stage three in Carmarthenshire. A team time trial of just 18 kilometres awaited, okay, and St Piran, the first team off the start rank. All eyes, though, were on team Yumbo Visma as they set off, and they set a wicked fast pace, averaging around 52 or 53 kilometres an hour. Unfortunately for them, it all started to go a bit wrong as they got closer to the finish and Pascal Enkhorn having a puncture. Still, he managed to cross the line and Jumbo Visma sat in the hot seat. Next to Kerning Quickstep, another very organised World Tour team trying their hardest to cross the 18km course to dethrone Jumbo Visma. And they managed it, the kind of punchy effort that suits the likes of Mark Cavendish and Julian Alaphilippe. The final most likely contenders to win today's stage, Ineos Grenadiers, and once more very organised as they left the start ramp. Ethan Hayter in the light blue points skin suit, moving through very swiftly for the benefit of his more experienced teammates. It was touch and go into the final corner. Could Hayter's teammates put him in the leader's jersey? 20.38 is the time, 26 seconds, it's going to be tight, but I think he's going to do it. Ineos Grenadiers then, going for the line, pushing for the line, Hater crosses the line, he takes the stage with his teammates, the Ineos Grenadiers. So, it's all change at the top of the GC after stage three in the team time trial in Carmarthenshire. Ethan Hater in the AJ Bell blue leader's jersey from Rowan Dennis, his teammate, Wout van Aert, third on the virtual podium. Julian Alaphilippe is in fourth, and Mikhail Froelich Honore rounds out the top five. Hater in very good company indeed. Once more joined here in Llandidno by a former winner of the Tour of Britain, Pippa York. And Pippa, great job done yesterday by Ineos Grenadiers to put Ethan Hater in the AJ Bell leader's jersey. It was. I think they probably planned that and didn't expect it to go so well. You know, the other teams had a few problems. And Ethan Hater, you know, he looked as strong as the potential big engines in, the, in their team. Yeah, he's a, he's a solid all-rounder, isn't he? I mean, he said yesterday he's been in the GC jersey at every race, every stage race he's done this year, whether he's ended up winning it or not. Yeah, he did say that. And, that, and for somebody who's 22 years old, it's quite remarkable that he's already reached that level yeah. and remarkably mature as well. Are we expecting the Grenadiers and the other big teams to do a bit, a bit better job today trying to control the race? Because we know what happened on stage two, the solo breakaway of Robin Carpenter actually succeeded. So they've got to atone for that, haven't they, today? Yes, the last thing they want on this, on this really long stage, it's hot sun. You know, they want to keep it kind of under control, not the usual chaos at the start. So, you know, they'll probably let a break go and, you know, control it from there. Yeah, let's have a closer look now at today's stage. This year's Queen stage hugs the coastline before the first sprint at Borth. The Category 2 climb of Bulchlan Bach follows with another dash at Talsarnai. The peloton then enters the Snowdonia National Park for the ascent of Ida's Well. The cyclists have one final sprint at Dol Garog on their way to the lung-busting double climb of the Great Orm and the mountaintop finish on the limestone headland dominating the northern coastline. Aberaeron is a small town on the Wales Coast Path. The harbour quayside is lined with colourful Georgian houses and is also a favourite stop-off point for walkers along the 60-mile Ceredigion section of the Wales Coast Path. Llandidno is the largest seaside town in Wales, with the North Shore dominated by its sweeping promenade. It's also home to the longest pier in the country, with the coastline dominated by the Great and Little Orm headlands. 
We are exactly halfway through the week's racing, right here at the end of the Queen stage in Clandidno. By the time the riders get here today, Adam, 200 k's in the legs, they'll do a lap of this headland before they head straight up the Great Orm. Expecting fireworks here today. Definitely, I'm expecting fireworks on myself as well. I've not been on the bike much, so I'll probably explode. But yeah, it is going to be a fantastic final. And for the likes of Alaphilippe, Wout Van Aert, it is right up their street. We're going to have to see what Ethan Hayter can do today. And if he can hang on, we're going to have to see what we're going to have to do. Let's go have a look at it. On to you. you come on then. <laughs> Side of the start says 20 percent i mean this is a brutal start to this isn't it yeah and you're the looking ahead is... it's just ramping up in front this just to me says alaphilippe all day long maybe richie port nah could stretch his legs for ineos i think he'll try i think michael woods is going to be on the burner today 12 gradient 14 15 percent now 16. holy moly do you want to walk this really kicks up. Whose idea was this? Your terrible idea. It was my idea. idea. Starting to hurt a lot. Thighs, lungs, everything. Legs. 18% now. Mate, how are you feeling? Not great. Not great at all. This is probably the steepest part. Go on. Show them how the pros do it. I can't. 19%. Oh. Come on, Barbet. You can do it. I didn't have breakfast. There's a sign there. 1K to go. A little bit of rest by here. Over the cattle grid. Slightly downhill here. I'm going to say downhill. It's not exactly downhill. Come on, Matt. You all right, mate? I'm all right. I feel like I've died. I think it's roughly 500 metres to go. Yeah. And that bit of respite, it's not exactly respite, is it? No. You know it's steep, but it drops from 20 to 10 and you feel like you're having a rest. Interestingly, I think when they come onto that climb, they almost need to go full gas from the bottom. You reckon? You don't need to, but if you want to shake up the GC. Yeah. Slight little kick here, it just flattens off. To the finish though. Be nothing for them after that, 5 percent ish. How's Cav gonna get up that? Slowly. Tram tracks near the top, cattle grid. That is gonna be fun and games. Game changing. This there is it. it is. Welcome to the Great Hall, madam. Thanks. Being completely straight with you, that is one of the hardest climbs I have done, and certainly one of the hardest climbs I remember ever being on the Tour of Britain. It's an absolute brute. There are going to be fireworks later. Let's bear in mind that we have a former winner of the Mountains Classification competition at both the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia right here, Pippa. Give us some tips on the technique. What, what should we be looking out for in the riders as they hit the bottom of that uh, Great Orm climb? The thing was, when it's a, a really steep ramp at the bottom, is to keep as much momentum as you can and not get caught behind the riders who are leading into the climb for their leaders, because they're going to go backwards really quickly. So you need a good position, and that's probably more vital than the, the kind of climbing ability straight onto the, those first ramps. I know when you were doing these big climbs, you'd be on a gear like 42, 21 or something ludicrous like that. What will they be on today? Oh, I imagine to be riders 39, 25, maybe someone 27, if they want to save their legs for the other days. Yeah, I wish I was on that. Um, no word of a lie, I actually snapped my chain doing that early, which is why you don't see me towards the end of that video. It's putting down too much power, clearly. Let's hear from some of the riders right now. I mean, I certainly think uh, De Koenig and Jumbo are going to take the race to Ineos. They're not just going to roll around and be like, you know, yeah, we'll wait. I think, uh, I think, like you say, it's quite a definitive stage. They know that if they're going to sort of rattle the cage, it's got to be done today at some point. It'd have to be a sort of concerted effort by a couple of teams to try and dislodge, um, dislodge Ineos and, sort of, you know, that's going to be quite tough. And, I, you know, I think for us, with the nature of how punchy Woodsy and Dan are, and the final suits us. Yeah, everyone's full of morale and this the situation we wanted to be in with the jersey now. Um, so yeah, we'll take it day by day, not take anything for granted, but do our best to defend it. With Julian, it's, it suits him super well. Uh, it's Let's say it's similar to uh, Moody Wee in, in Flesh Wallon or a climb like that. 
So yeah, we have to be in great position from the from the bottom of the climb, and then I think the the legs will speak for themselves up up there. Really pleased to say I've been joined by Jonathan Day of British Cycling. And, and Jonathan, big events are your thing. I guess there's renewed vigour after the pandemic, after the success of the uh, Olympians and Paralympians, to double down on that and get more people enjoying bike races like this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a major events, big flagship events are, are super important. And we know we've, we've been involved in this for, for clearly for some time with, with great performances from our British athletes, but also we like to look at how we can utilize, use those events, particularly to, to excite and, and engage, get more people involved in cycling, which is, which is what it's all about as well, right? Yeah, it, it certainly is. And finally, we've seen over the past 18 months of the pandemic, more people getting out there, exercising in all sorts of ways, but especially riding their bikes. Hard to buy bikes in some places. You must want to keep that ball rolling. Oh, absolutely. H hugely important to us. Listen, we've, we've just launched a new strategy as well, uh, really to, re at the heart of that is very much around leading our sport and inspiring our communities as well. So we're not only looking at putting on major events to excite and inspire people, but also really looking at how we work with communities to get more people on bikes, support them in that process and get them involved in this fantastic sport. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Great to see you as well. The best riders in the world racing on British roads. Let's get straight to our commentators now, Adam Blythe and Ned Bolting. Thanks, Matt. A real sense of foreboding and drama hanging over this race as we look down at the start line as they roll out from Aberdeen. It could be the last day of this extraordinary heat wave that we've enjoyed in the British Isles over the last three days. Storms are forecast <laughs> and thundery uh, towards the end of today's very long stage. 210 kilometres, the longest stage of them all on this edition of the AJ Bell Tour of Britain. And high drama, quite rightly, I think, it's being billed as the Queen stage. Significant amounts of climbing to come today. And unlike the stages in Devon and Cornwall, the climbing today is relatively, for want of a better word, uh, Adam, structured, isn't it? There are, there are prolonged flat sections and then quite sort of detailed and significant sections of climbing within before it flattens out again. Yeah, there definitely is. It is a very, very tough day for these riders today. It's 210k. We, see, we do see longer stages like this in, uh, in a lot of the stage races, but on British roads, I know we've talked about before, there's just no real flow with them. They're very, very difficult roads to ride on, um, and it does sap the energy right away from your legs. So a long day for these guys, and a lot of climbing in there for them too, and that last climb is a great all. Oh, yeah, it's a steep one. It is indeed. Well, they continue to roll out of Abad Ayaron. The flag has yet to drop. The pace is being controlled as the neutralised rollout gets underway. Welcome back to the Queen stage of the 2021 AJ Bell Tour of Britain. From a virtual standing start, a break of six riders was then allowed to get away. Once more, Jacob Scott of Canyon DHB Sun God was one of those and added to his sprint points in Borth, dueling it out with Welshman Griff Lewis of Ribble Weltite, who pipped him on the line. Having allowed the gap to get out to over nine minutes, Tony Martin of Yumbo Visma decided that was getting too big. The Skoda King of the Mountains points at Bulchlinbach were collected by the green jersey, defending his lead in that competition. Scott also picked up maximum points in the Iceberg Sprint Dash in Telsarnay. By the time the peloton officially entered Snowdonia, they had the gap down and under control. As we rejoin Ned and Adam, the first cat climb of Aether's Well looms. Four kilometres from the top of this big climb. And uh, it's De Kerning quick step, riding hard on the front. Davide Ballerini continuing his big turn of effort, and Ethan Hayter looking cool as a cucumber, the leader of the general classification, quite far back down the line. If the camera were to widen out, we'd see uh, just about where he is. There only we about, are, only about four or five riders behind him. His team, the rest of his team, gathered all around the front of the race, where normally, normally you'd expect him to be. But Adam has noticed, <laughs> he's quite right, over just the last couple of days racing, this tendency Hayter has, for better or worse, 
to be a little bit out of position. He's got a Steve Cummings S about him, who is his sports director. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but interestingly, Mark Cavendish at the back as well there. He's, I spoke to him out the other day and he said he's quite injured from that crash. He had someone hit in the back of him, so probably not feeling the best. Um, but yeah, you can just see the wind look, just picking up a little bit. The rider's just moving into the middle of the road there. It's it's not easy this climb, so it is a surprise with, with all every single Ineos Grenadiers rider, apart from their main rider, up towards the front. But, but I, we spoke about this last night. Just because that's where they're sitting doesn't deem it's the right place to be. That might be the best place for the team to ride together, but that doesn't mean that's the best place for Hayter. And Hayter riding individually like this, this might be the best thing for him. It looks deliberate, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. Up at the, the second group, Ben Healy, Tom Gloke, who's a, a former club mate of Ethan Hayter, three years his junior, the Londoner, slots onto the wheel of Marc Soler. These three riders now are closing in on the uh, front of the race, 48 seconds to gap now, but the uh, blue jersey group and uh, being spearheaded by Deconic Quickstep, they're coming across too. Only 50 seconds to gap uh, between groups two and three on the road, so the whole race is compressing now. It's all coming back together again, and it may well come back before the top of this climb. Yeah, I think it will do. I don't think it will all come back together. I think group that chasing group with Soler in there, the Trinity there. Racing Rides, I think they'll get there, but the yeah. peloton will have to really push on. But with this wind, you know, you can see the little downhill sections there. This bit is not too steep. They can really put a lot of damage in here if the wind is really blowing. Which normally it would be, and it is quite strong today. The forecast do suggest it's coming from the southeast. Uh, right across, I think they're right shoulders at the moment. That's the peloton. There we go, Hater, look, just moving up on the right-hand side, you see behind the orange rally rider, just slowly moving up, back of the peloton now, just slotting in there, so slowly moving up, noticing the crosswinds, a little bit of an easing of gradient. As the camera moves up the road, we try and pick out the Soler Healy group, there they are, just out of sight and around a few corners. About to turn in a uh, left-handed direction and experience the wind possibly in their backs at this point. Big old gap, isn't it? 50 seconds that gap is. And then from the trio of riders, the chase group, up front to the front of the race. Well, there you are. That's a little bit less that gap, but it's still fairly substantial. 40 seconds uh, according to the time measurements, but they are beginning to hone in on slightly flatter roads now on to the top of the climb. Just a couple of K left. A little bit less than a couple of K, actually. One and a half. Yes, yeah, so you can see the climbing a lot quicker. Back in the big chain ring now, so... It's one of the feedbacks being thrown to a fan. But, yeah, you can just see the speed on this climb. This must be one of the quicker parts of the climb now where these fans are able to push on more. And you can see the flag there, Ned. So it is a crosswind from the right-hand shoulder yep. to the left shoulder. So for that peloton behind, they'll be aware of that, and that's why we'll have seen Hater which we think was Hater, just trying to move up a little bit. There he is in the middle of your screen, just behind those rally riders, just moving up there in the middle. So he's moved up a little bit, just on the very, very bottom, and Dan Martin, noticeably there, just towards the back a little bit. So Hater moving up, and he's, you know, they'll have got um, the direction. We saw a couple of Jumbo Visma Swan year at the top. They'll know all this information. They'll have a recon car out the front, probably, um, telling them where the wind's coming from. So he'll be aware of it. He'll be aware that he needs to move up, and with his whole team, they'll be able to just slot in behind him and get comfortable. Great race we've had on this climb. Very dynamic, animated really by the uh, Trinity Racing duo going off in pursuit of uh, Marc Soler. And there is Ethan Hayter in the dark blue jersey alongside Rory Townsend in the light blue jersey. Still, still not at the front by any means, but uh, Connor Swift alongside him. Just look, he does look very relaxed though, Ethan Hayter. Yeah, there's no urgency about him. He's not wanting to get to the front at the minute, is he? He's happy where he is. It's an attack. George Bennett. Oh, no, it's not an attack. It's oh, just... no, it's just Bennett. Yeah, repositioning himself. Jumbo Visma then reappearing towards the front. I think they are expecting Ooh. to pick up some water bottles there. Ooh, this, is this is a very, very exposed open. section, and the wind is whipping across this grassland uh, from the right to the left, and they drift right over. And uh, this could be a moment that De Koenig Quickstep or Jumbo Visma could exploit. We are definitely talking things up and expecting big things here, aren't we, Ned? I really well, do hope look at this. It. I mean, the way they just... 66 like They were all go. blown over to the left-hand side of the road, though, weren't they? Yeah, 66 k's to go, and that is just enough to, you know, that distance where you do think, if we can split it here, it is going to cause a lot of damage for these riders that are maybe distance, catch a few people off guard. And if De Kooning and Quickstep really realise now where Ethan Hayter is and the wind is up, they could put him in serious trouble. 
Meantime, the battle for King of the Mountains points goes the way almost inevitably of Jake Scott. And that was almost an accord that was reached there, an understanding between Sessler and Scott. And Scott picks up the first Cat 1 climb of the Tour of Britain with Sessler picking up nine points for second place. Chasing group here, not too far behind as well, just cresting the top of that, almost cresting the top of that KOM now, so not far to go for these riders across the group. 32 seconds. The Peloton have brought back a little bit of time on these riders, but they brought back time on the breakers as well, so also holding their own at the minute. But just look at that win there on the Skoda flags. Ben Healy characteristic on the, on the uh, bike, that very, very idiosyncratic racing position he has with his left, with his head tilted over to the left. Mark Soler and Tom Gloke. These three couldn't look any more different as bike riders, could they? <laughs> Very different physiologically. <laughs> I mean, Mark Soler is in a kind of class all of his own, isn't he? Yes, yeah, I wonder what's Nicholas Sessler, yeah, he's looking for a bottle uh, from the Global Six one year at the side of the road. Picks it. Oh, that's unfortunate. That is unfortunate. You see him asking the Cayo Royale. Second chance. Cajarura bottle. Uh, no, couldn't get that well, I mean, that was his own fault. He could have left a little bit of distance in between him and the Cayo Real one. He wanted to give him one, but he just couldn't quite get there. See now the neutral service car just moving up on the front. The Peloton, you can see riders more coming to the front now of the Peloton, getting ready. They know there's a lot of wind. They know there's crosswind. So just moving up the rally rider there on the left-hand side. Riders slowly creeping towards the front there. Still 66 k's to go and a tough 66 k as well, but... And you can just see the face. Tim de Klerk now, I didn't really notice. Tim de Klerk on the front, so it's got serious. If Tim de Klerk's come to the front, it's for a reason. There's one man that can ride at a hard tempo for a long time, and he's the man on the front right now, Tim de Klerk. Eve Lampard still behind him, zip wide open. Must be warm out there today as well if he's got the zip all the way down. You can just see how slowly strung out it's getting. You can see Ben Tullick from Alpha Sim Phoenix just coming out of our shot there, just trying to move up ever so slightly. Ribblewell type riders moving up now with James Shaw. Rally riders following them up. Back down the line to try and spot the leader. It's interesting. So Eve Lampard just rolled over the top there of, of Tim de Klerk. And if you're doing that, normally you're quite happy with the situation. But if you can roll past him and get a little bit of a, a chain gang going, we like to call it in England, but it's just a through and off motion, that will automatically speed things up a little bit. That will make increase the pace. This is very exposed on the top of here and in narrow road as well. So if there were to be crosswinds, the road is not big. It's not big enough for the peloton. If they put it over to one side, there'll be only a certain amount of room for those riders to fit in to get that maximum shelter. So De Kuhn and Quickstep decide to do something here, which by the looks of things, they might be doing that they could make a, a little bit of a difference here. But there uh, we go. Andre getting Greifel. on the front instead. And uh, Robin Carpenter, yesterday's winner with uh, Team Rally. You've been trying to move closer to the front. I have made it right to the front. Andre Greipel then and Reto Hollenstein for the Israel Startup Nation. And, uh, it's not quite there for uh, De Koenig Quickstep. They don't feel it. They've sniffed the air and they've figured that uh, right at the moment there isn't much to gain. So they ease off a little bit. Andre Greipel takes over at the front for the Israel Startup Nation. Jake Scott taking 10 points, uh, Nicholas Sessler 9, and uh, the rest, well, not of any great relevance in the uh, latest standings where. Jake Scott overall has a substantial lead over Nicholas Sessler, who's in second place in the overall standings, but Scott's lead has grown enormously. We'll be back after a short break. Just over the top of Ada's well, the six were joined by the three chasers and looked like they'd be allowed to stay away. But then attacks off the front of the peloton brought everything back together again. De Koenig Quickstep wanted to keep the pace high and tire out their rivals. Finally, a trio was allowed to get away again. Mauro Schmidt of Team Gubek and Next Hash, David Gonzalez of Caja Rural and Max Cantor of Team DSM, who took the last sprint in Dolgarog. They were quickly swallowed up, though, as the big teams and their leaders spread across the road. The great Orm is ahead of the peloton as we rejoin Adam and Ned. That is the Orm Peninsula, that uh, supplies the altitude gain where they go over the marine drive, uh, the north, to, facing out to the north, 
And then the uh, last climb, 1.7 kilometers in length, gradients touching 18%, 20% even at times, especially in the first 700 meters. Here they come into the outskirts of Glendidno with De Koenig Quickstep in control at the front, as you'd imagine, with five riders, including their man for the day, the world champion, Julian Alaphilippe. What a treat. Yeah, getting that positioning right. You see Ballerini now coming up to the front. He'll try and save Mark Cavendish for as long as he can. Mark Cavendish can sit in the wheels a little bit. He can serve them a little bit better. He's still got Eve Lampard in front of Alaphilippe there, but Ballerini still on the front. And look at the speed of him, just gapping Eve Lampard a little bit, but just really laying down the hammer. As you said, Ned, he has done an absolute amazing ride today. He's been stellar. He's been stellar, the Italian. What a great ride. And by the way, a little interesting interloper has just got himself onto the wheel almost of Julian Alaphilippe there. I think Hayter's decided Van Aert's the, the wheel to match, isn't it? And the wheel to take and the rider to look out for. He's looking for that Belgian national champion's jersey. Alaphilippe's doing it as Alaphilippe wants to do it. I wonder whether Alaphilippe feels that he has to go early and take a little advantage onto the final climb and might even attack on the marine drive climb. I think they'll make it hard round there, and that road is very twisty. It's very... it's quite narrow. It's up and down, and there you go. Oh, I'm dual on the right-hand side. Team Ineos moving Ethan Hayter up now. We've got Alex Dowson, it looks to be Michael Wards on his wheel. He'll take off, moving into position from Team DSM. Connor Swift looks like he's the protected rider for the day uh, for the Arkea Samsic team, as Zondro Maurice on the wheel of uh, Jimmy Janssens from Alpes and Phoenix gets into position, but it's Mark Cavendish on the front with his former teammate, Michal Kriakowski, on his wheel. Cavendish a bit dislodged from the rest of his team as Julian Alaphilippe drifts across to the right-hand side of the road. Cavendish looks around, uh, sees where he is. Cavendish's day is done <laughs> and uh, drops away. Alaphilippe, though, right on the wheel now of Ethan Hayter. Where is, where is Wat Van Aert? He's a little bit further back now as uh, Hayter moves very close to the front of this race. Yep, Hayter right up and towards the front. He's got two teammates, Rowan Dennis, three teammates with him. And let's not forget, as we keep mentioning, Rowan Dennis second on the general classification. He'll look to set a hard tempo up that climb to try and discourage any attacks. But the way that De Koenig puts over Ryan, the way Alaphilippe has been sitting, where he's been sitting his whole day, has been right up towards the front. Dan Martin now on the shoulder of the Arkea Samsek riding his Zolo, moving Simon Clark up on the left-hand side. Green jersey of Jake Scott still in the mix at this point. There he is, what a phenomenal ride. He's been on the breakaway, his third breakaway all day, and he's still towards the front, but he's working for Max Stedman, his teammate, and Rory Tanzend, trying to set up the uh, young climber, Max Stedman, uh, to pull a big surprise against the big guns here, as with 10 kilometers to go now, 10K to go on the outskirts of Hlandidno. This is the big finale that we've been anticipating on the Queen stage. The breakaways have been, the successive breakaways have been caught. The race is coming together as now they get onto the slopes of the Marine Drive climb. Here they go. It's a narrow in there of the riders as well. So if you're at the back there, you can see the riders out, the saddle accelerating, opposite to what the riders on the front are doing, holding that tempo. Dan Bingham on the front now with, um, for Ribble well tight on the right hand side of Ineos Grenadiers. James Shaw on his wheel. It's a rider from Movistar who's there. I think it's uh, the American Matteo Jorgensen. Uh, but it's Owen Duhl, a Welshman now, leading the Tour of Britain up the climb of the Marine Drive on the Great Orme Peninsula on the outskirts of Glendidno. Behind them, the seaside resort looks up to see the battle uh, being sparked into life on this penultimate climb. When they get over the top, there'll be 6K remaining on today's stage. Ineos Grenadiers, though, firmly in control of the pace, and the Welshman is setting a deterring pace, trying to avoid the prospect of anyone launching an attack off his pace. So Ineos really dictating terms with four riders on the front, the fourth of them being the blue jersey himself, Ethan Ata. Yeah, oh, and Dill there doing a great job of just setting a hard tempo for them, discouraging any attacks from any other teams at the minute. So, as I said, setting a hard tempo when Team Ineos right at the front, the place you want to be, and tucked on that Ethan Hayter's wheel, as you mentioned there, Ned Alaphilippe. He's not got any teammates left, I don't believe, maybe one around him, but I'm not seeing them for a little bit, so riding solo at the minute almost. Well, Van Aert lurking, if you could lurk in that very visible Belgian national champions jersey in around about 10th place, looking very cool indeed. Yeah, one de Kooning quick step rider just towards the back of that peloton there, you can just see him. Might be Yves Lampard by the looks of thing, maybe trying to move up if he can to try and help Alaphilippe. He'll wait until the climb's done, try and move up on the descent to, to minimise the effort he has to do so he can deliver him onto the bottom of that climb in a good position. What a finale, what a spectacle these uh, cliff faces are. The waves just lapping up the shore and the sense of brooding menace coming from this race that's unfolding on the marine drive as Duhl continues to ride on the front. He'll know this climb extremely well, Owen Duhl. 
and uh, he is racing up it for all he's worth now. His finish line will probably be the top of the climb and then he'll be done. Got a set of pace uh, that stops any possibility of a counter-attack or an attack coming from this group. So Duhl and Ineos Grenadiers in control, but still a couple of kilometres to go on this climb. Yep, still a couple of K to go, but you can just tell it's going so quickly, isn't it? It's not really a climb this round here. It's it's up and down, it's left and right, but it's not a real climb. No one's out the saddle, they're all sit down, seated power. I think it's Mikkel Onore, possibly, uh, the De Koenig quick step rider who's moving up on the left-hand side of the road. And Alaphili, for the first time, has got a teammate with him for quite a while. So De Koenig quick step with one, at least, back in the mix. Two. Here. Eve Lampot's just at the back and uh, Tim de Klerk is just at the back. So with this narrow road, very, very hard to move up. And you'll see them when the road opens. Eve Lampot there, just on the near side of our screen, closest to us. Just tucked in behind the Ribble, well tight rider there. Just a little bit back, but you can just see it's not easy to move up. But Alaphilippe now back with a teammate in front of him, sheltering from that wind. Mikel Odore is the man. Wat Van Aert there, look at him. Just, I mean, of all the other riders who've been kind of moving up and down, getting protection, he's just been sitting, sitting in roughly that spot in the peloton all yeah. this while. There you go, Yves Lampard right on the side of the road, just trying to move up to the world champion, Alaphilippe, try and get in front of him, try and help him ever so slightly. Matt Gibson just Here he comes, there, there he is. is. There's the move from Lampard up on the right-hand side, sweeps past the pairing Ooh. from Movistar. It's getting a bit sketchy there. It's just now in the roads, the twists and turns, the lefts and rights, but... James Shaw is on his wheel, and then sitting on his wheel is Matt Gibson, the two riders from uh, Ribble Well Tight. The waiting continues and the pacemaking has stopped now from Owen Duhl. That's all he can do. I say all he can do is a huge ride actually for Duhl Tim and Michal Kwiatkowski takes over. But left hand side of the roads, it's uh, Mikkel Honore and Yves Lampartz who are. Got, um, oh, it's Tim De Klerk, Klerk, isn't it? You're absolutely right. Tim De Klerk has appeared from nowhere. Alex Peters alongside him from Carbon, Swift Carbon. And uh, Michal the, ide the ideal situation now is Kiyototti looked over to the side. They've only got the one and two on general classification left. He should try and get one of the decoining quick step riders to ride in front of him. He should try and save himself going into the bottom of the climb so he can accelerate to keep Rowan and Ethan Hayter in that great position. At the minute, it's getting easier. Not really easier for... Oh, an attack now from Movistar. Yeah, Matteo Jorgensen, I think, is the rider to go. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is indeed Matteo Jorgensen, the American now. He's a powerful rider, a grand tour racer, and uh, they've got to keep an eye on this. Michal Kwiatkowski and Rowan Dennis uh, will have to limit uh, the advantages that he gets on the road. He's a good, good rider, Jorgensen. He's had an excellent 2021, and he's strong. He is strong indeed. I think going into the bottom of that last climb, they can, they can afford to give up with the, the quality that's in that field, maybe 20 seconds, 15 seconds. I think, you know, it's not too much stress at the minute for them. You see Kiyotoski just sat on the front still. The, the four De Koning quick step riders, Wout Van Aert just on his own, just sat behind Alex Peters there from Swift Carbon Racing. Rowan Dennis on the wheel of Michal Kwiatkowski, then Hater looking unflustered, relaxed and totally in control with his two teammates setting the pace. Meantime, Jorgensen has to uh, exploit this situation to the best of his ability and hope that he takes some sort of potentially race-winning margin over the top. He's built up an eight-second advantage, and he's got about 500 metres of this climb to go, if that's accurate, before he gets over the top. It flattens out a little bit on Marine Drive, and then he'll drop down, go round the peninsula, and head up to the final climb. But that is a very, very slender advantage indeed for Jorgensen. When they start to attack on the steep slopes, that could be scrubbed out really quickly. Yeah, very quickly indeed. I think you have to save a lot for that last climb. Not save a lot, but be as efficient as you can before the bottom of it, because it is a hell of a climb. It kicks up straight away as soon as you get to go around a left airpin at the top as he just crests the top of that kilometer KOM there. So one more climb to go back. As I was saying, you come into the climb. Jumbo Visma now moving up on the bottom. Come into the climb, a sharp left under an airpin, and then it just ramps up a little bit of respite, and then bam, straight again, 20%. 10 seconds. Jorgensen took a 10-second lead over the Ineos Grenadiers, who've now got four riders there, including the race leader, uh, Ethan Hayter. Carlos Rodriguez has appeared magically from nowhere. Dan McClay sat just behind that. The Koenig quick step rider there, Michael Woods, just sat in front of him. Dan Martin still there as well, towards the front from the Israel Startup Nation. That's the peloton. What remains of the peloton? It's not the peloton, full peloton at all. So, big group off the back already as the spectacular descent around the Orm Peninsula. The Great Orm unwinds and they head back into the outskirts of uh, Hlandidno and then up the Great Orm climb. 5.4k to go. Matteo Jorgensen, the young American, has attacked off the front. Beautiful descent, isn't it? 
gorgeous, lovely road. Sweeping descent, perfect road surface, and Jorgensen's pushing on here. Good ride from him. Been a very interesting rider to watch over this year. His uh, progression at Movistar. It's just very unusual to see Movistar sign an American rider, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah, and it's great to see that they're looking far afield, not just the Spanish riders, but five kilometres to go now. Just about to go through that sign up ahead of them. 5k to go for the peloton now. We'll be back after a short break. Here it is now. This is the bottom of the climb straight into it. So they run it here with a little bit of speed, a tight airpin coming up, and then it really does just go whoff. Straight up, there you go. Eat Lampard. Lampard, he's done. Mikel Honore takes over. Wout van Aert has no teammates with him. Very quickly, it's filtering down as George Bennett gets onto the front now. Bennett now, the teammate of uh, Wout van Aert to set an infernal pace for as long as he can. Ala Philippe, it's the expected suspects, the usual suspects, the riders we expect to see in this position who come to the fore. You see Ethan Hayter just at the bottom of your screen there, not reacting to too much anything yet, just judging his effort. Not just going with trying to jump up a few positions. Dan Martin just in front of him. Alaphilippe tucked in on the Tikunin quick step riders wheel. Just behind there, Wout van Aert with George Bennett setting this absolutely furious pace. I did not go up this climb this quickly this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go down it that fast. These are the really steep slopes and the waiting continues. It's uh, Sergio Martin from Caja Rural riding up alongside uh, Julian Alaphilippe and looking like he might be thinking about an attack, but no one can off this pace being set by George Martin. Wout van Aert perfectly happy with this situation at the moment. Come over here now, there's a small little flat part, not really too flat, you clot a tram track and then you ramps up 17, 80% and you turn right around the corner and that is the final last real dig of the climb. It plateaus at the top of that, so if we're going to see an attack, be over these tram lines, it's just about to go over now, around there and it's the next right-hand corner, last 150, 200 metres where it's the last killer blow really before the climb, they've got a bit of distance. Watch out for Michael Woods, finish, watch out for Michael Woods on the right-hand side of the road, he snuck away on that side and Michael Woods, the Canadian, it's, it looks slow, doesn't it? But the, that's only because of the gradients, but that blows away all the helpers and it blows away Ethan Hayter at this point as well as Wat van Aert, Julian Alaphilippe and uh, Simon go clear with Mikel Honoré and Hayter has been dropped. 13% the gradients here and Michael Woods has all this talent on his wheel. I'm not sure if Hayter's dropped. I saw him look down there in SSRM and he's a very calculated rider. He knows exactly what he does. He doesn't want to go into the red too much. You can just see him sat within the saddle. He's just been distanced. He's Gapped just judging his, he's, he's yeah. judging his effort. Yeah. If he responds to this, goes into the red, then he'll explode. He needs to just do what he can up this climb. Remember, the GC position is critical for Ethan Hayter. He knows that he might not win this stage. He knows that Wat van Aert might, and that Wat van Aert does win the stage, then he's got to limit his losses to six seconds in terms of a time gap over the road. But we're 1.2k from home, and Alaphilippe and Wat van Aert have dispensed with the rest. Michael Woods, right. then, from the Israel Startup Nation, still setting a pace as it kicks up again. Hellish gradient here. Even Wat van Aert is struggling, oh, and Wat van Aert is being dropped by Alaphilippe, and he goes past them all on the left-hand side of the road. Alaphilippe has made a big move on this climb, and it's so unusual to see Wout van Aert struggling just to get onto the wheel of Michael Woods and Alaphilippe. Woods digging in, though. Yeah, Woods digging in, and Ala, he's not dropped yet. You get over this cattle trigger, then it plateaus a little bit, drops down ever so slightly, but they will not carry any speed on there. One kilometre to go now, as wow. I said, it flattens off. And for the likes of Ethan Hayter, who's been judging himself, this is where he'll make the time up. Just not easing off the pace, not worried about this race that's happening in the front for the stage win. He will just judge himself. So be able to claw back a tiny little bit of time on this section, just stick to his effort. But you can see that gap growing ever so slightly round this corner, drop down ever so much, and then another little kick. If they start to look at each other and uh, try and figure out how any of them could possibly beat Wout van Aert here, that will be to uh, Ethan Hayter's benefit. Yeah, you see Ethan Hayter now, that gap riders, slowly coming back. That's Hayter with a rider on his wheel, isn't it? Mikel Honoré, it must be, from De Quick Step. So Hayter is, uh, has got the De Koenig Quick Step man on his wheel. And that gap is around about, well, it's around about that critical six seconds at the moment that yeah. Hayter uh, needs to try and close. But I think he's doing it. Wat van Aert, I think, realises what's at stake here. Yeah, he does indeed. It kicks up again here, but these riders are just playing at the minute. They're not committing to the time gap. They're thinking about the stage when there's 10 seconds up for bonus. So I don't think Hayter's going to lose too much time from this. I think we'll probably see a sprint come from these three riders. Alaphilippe going on the tackle that climb. Look to be the strongest rider. Wow, Van Aert limiting his, his distance there. All of them in the big ring as well. So not in the little ring. Wow, Van Aert on the front. It wouldn't surprise me if you saw Ethan Hayter just come back into shot in a minute. 
Alaphilippe looking around. Woods tenacious. Woods looking like he might attack. Woods attacking, and Alaphilippe, I think, saw that coming. Has he got the legs to go with the Canadian? Yes, he has for now. Shuts it down again, and they stall and wait. And all the time they're doing this, Ethan Hayter is plugging away and trying to close that gap. Alaphilippe's got to go. You can see him looking behind in a big gear. There he there is, he Ethan is. Hayter. So judging his effort perfectly there, as we said, just not doing, going crazy. It's Honoré attacks now. Wout Van Aert gets straight back on the wheel. Mikel Honoré sits in fifth place in the general classification himself in the same time as Julian Alaphilippe. Honoré now trying to stretch things out and make it hard. 200 metres to go. How can they possibly stop Wout Van Aert here? Julian Alaphilippe has to go now and he has to hold his advantage to take the win. Alaphilippe then has the Belgian on his wheel. Wout Van Aert knows he's there. Can he get past him? These two doing a brilliant battle at the top of the Great Hall. Van Aert oh, Van alongside Aert. Alaphilippe. Van Aert over the line, but only just. Van Aert takes the win from Julian Alaphilippe and he takes a little bit of a gap over Hater. And uh, that gap came from nowhere, but Van Aert takes the win, takes the 10 seconds. Julian Alaphilippe will improve his GC positioning as well vis a vis Ethan Hater by taking six points for second place. This was how he did it. Yeah, this is how he did it indeed. And you could just see him wanting to accelerate a bit, and this is a big acceleration just to get on Alaphilippe's wheel, and it was just a drag race, wasn't it? Until the last five, six metres, we didn't know what was going to happen. You can see both of them absolutely flat out. Alaphilippe just slightly moving right, trying to just nudge him off his line a little bit, but at this point, Wout Van Aert just got past him, but literally all the way to the line, and just that clock ticking by as we went through there. It looked to be Wout Van Aert, look at him, the effort he had to put in there. My word. In the fetal position. Look at that, both of them on the ground. Both of them on the ground. An incredible duel on the Great Orm saw the Belgian champion just beating the world champion on the line to take the stage win. Wout Van Aert giving everything to claim his second stage win of this year's tour. I want this victory quite bad. For me, it was uh, the most important stage of this, uh, this tour, the tour of Britain. Uh, it was a big test for me, and um, yeah, uh, then also you can go a bit over the limit to take to take the victory. And with the lead in the general classification of just two seconds from Ethan Hayter, with Julian Alaphilippe a further nine seconds back. The AJ Bell Tour of Britain blue jersey back on the shoulders of Wat van Aert. It's Tour of Britain, there's four really hard days to go, obviously, so it was probably the most selective finish, but it's loads of time bonuses, but Wout van Aert's very good at sprinting as well, so it's not like I can just do that, but I got six seconds on day two, and um, it's going to be a lot of racing to go, I think. Ethan Hayter is still top of the Sports Breaks points competition. As is Jacob Scott in the Skoda King of the Mountains competition after making the break again which also allowed the Canyon rider to consolidate his position at the top of the Iceberg Sprints. Wales never fails. The sunshine was out, but the racing was absolutely stellar, wasn't it, Pippa York, Adam Blythe, with me? We knew it was going to deliver fireworks, and it really did. We did. We had the expectations that has been set up for a, you know, a sprint between the two best kind of climbers or sprinters in the race on that kind of terrain, and that's exactly what we got. Yeah, uh, Adam and I tried that uh, climb this morning. Um, didn't end uh, very well for me especially, but to see them go up at Van Aert and Alaphilippe right to the top, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, was one of the best sights all year. Yeah, it definitely was. And those two are right on top of their game. You know, that terrain, it suits Alaphilippe more, I'd say, than, uh, than Wout van Aert there. But he put in a stellar performance and fighting it all the way to line. You know, only the last five metres it was decided. And just great to see those two battle it out on such hard terrain. Yeah, and we saw after they finished as well, they both collapsed. Van Aert was in the fetal position. They both went incredibly deep here on British roads. They did, yeah, and that just shows the nature of the roads here. It's not just that last climb that have made that effort. It's all the roads throughout the day. It's up and down, it's left and right, and typically the British roads, as we all know, they don't roll very well. It's quite difficult for them. So they did a fantastic ride, um, and it's great to see those two battle it out. And what's to come after this with Alaphilippe trying to get those seconds back against Ethan Hayter very fast, and Wout Van Aert, we all know, is super fast. It's going to be fascinating. We're exactly halfway through this year's Tour of Britain. Stage 5 coming tomorrow in Cheshire. Let's take a closer look now. There is a comparative respite for the riders on stage five with over 30 kilometers before the first sprint in Congleton. Blackie Bank is the first of three small Skoda King of the Mountains climbs with a fantastically named bottom of the oven coming before Bakestone Dale Road. The final two chances for points come in Wilmslow and Chelford 
The peloton then has 35 kilometers to gather its forces before a potential sprint finish into Warrington. So what do we think, Pippa? A few climbs in between, but there's quite a long downhill sort of finish into, uh, into Warrington. Could we see the bunch come together for a sprint? We all want to see Mark Cavendish win, a, win his 11th stage, I think it's going to be. So, you know, why not? Mm. You know, he's come here, green jersey at Tour de France. Everybody wants to see him win a stage here. So I'm rooting for him. I tell you what people don't want to see is us all wearing the same outfit tomorrow. So I'll send an email around first thing and we can, we can sort it out that way. Uh, don't forget highlights here on ITV4 tomorrow at 8 o'clock. But you can join us live for coverage in the morning as well. Thanks for your company. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.